So we have um, May Lisa, who has been communicating with me about um, wanting to be a volunteer. And we actually got, how long was it you were trying to get on the group? Oh, I think about two years or a year and a half, something like that. Well, we finally got her on the group. So we welcome May Lisa to Thank uh, you. volunteer. Uh, yeah, our first volunteership. And she's been studying EA for five years. Um, she likes mine because what I speak about resonates deeply with her. And she likes Matt Kahn, who's been a really big influence for me. And she's been feeling the inner shift that leaves you more withdrawn and isolated, work going inside. And she's feeling the soul more and more at times, and also struggling with what I would call her conditioning. Uh, we can call it the ego roles that I, my parents and peers expect me to play out, to which I add as a editorial comment, why do they expect you to play out these roles? Because that's how they are spending their lives. And, um, you know, it's interesting because when somebody is, um, in other words, when, you, when you're breaking conditioning, this is actually a message back to the people who love you and care about you and have told you that the right way to live is to follow conditioning. Because in a way, subconsciously, which they won't look at, it's sending a message to them that maybe they're doing something wrong or they might feel it that way. And that's a powerful method for somebody to take. And that's part of the pushback that we receive um, when we want to be authentic, when we're trying to live authentically. Um, May Lisa is apparently from this aware of what I call the, or I've learned to call the 3D reality, which is this one, and the 5D reality, which we're moving towards which basically means living from a conscious awareness of self as soul. It doesn't necessarily mean being enlightened, but it means realizing that the very concept that I am this personality is not a full, it's not the full picture and it's out of context. It has been the norm for a really long time. It's not wrong, but we're, we're waking up to a deeper level um, of who we really are. And that sets off a lot of reactions inside when, when that is occurring of fear, all sorts of things, because what am I doing and who am I to be the one to think that this is what I'm supposed to be doing and not doing what I'm all that. Um, well, she's saying she feels fear, shame, guilt, anxiety regularly. And as she parts, in other words, parts of you, what I call are, are woken up to realizing there's more going on, but not the, the whole you, you're, you're kind of waking, like most of us, you're waking up in stages or sections. And so we still have parts that we have learned that are not aligned to that. And they literally can have fights with each other. Uh, you know, what are you doing to me? <laughs> and, and so forth. And this is where we are at, at this point. Um, what is it? She's going through her second nodal return. And um, she tried to mentally prepare for the, the various transits that are coming. And that's good. I like the way you said that because we try 
to mentally prepare. And that's, that's good. That's, that's a necessary part, but we <laughs> get delivered the messages pretty quickly that it's, well, it's more than that. But it's, in other words, knowing what's coming helps us feel more secure about what's coming. I have often put it like, uh, somebody forgot to send me the email about all these changes my life was about to be going through. And that astrology can represent the missing email because it lets us know what's coming. But we literally don't know how to handle it because it's trying to take, or the major things, because it's taking us out of who we are and what we know into something we don't know yet. So there isn't any way we can know how to handle it. We learn it experientially. And that's a process many of us are in big time at this time. Um, and um, she's working, let's see. So I'll just, I'm not going to talk about all the specific transits, but she's working through family stuff, home situation. Uh, ancestral karma and I would say becoming aware of the extent of which the emotion you're affected by the subconscious emotional body that yeah. arises and creates anxiety at times, depression at times and so forth. I say, you know, to me even the awareness of this is like at least one third of the, the healing. Because as we become aware of it, we can do something about it. We start to do something about it and we're relearning. So um, we have, I don't know, about 10 minutes. So what would you like to talk about here? We have 10 minutes to talk? We have about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, Maybe a I think little you've longer. Summarized it. Um, right now with everything that's going on, well, that has been going on with the eclipses and now the after effect, I guess. Um, I've been feeling it a lot in my body. Um, I haven't been wanting to eat as much. I've been just like extremely tired. Like it, because all of that is um, squaring my ascendant. So I didn't expect it to be hitting me on a physical level so much. And mm. um, yeah, um, in terms of the ancestral karma, I could give a bit more information about that. Like, um, so my grandfather was an alcoholic and you know, I, I never got to meet him or anything. He died when I was one years old. So I didn't know much about him, but I started asking questions about him like last year to my dad. I don't know why, like I just had like a gut feeling about it. And um, he, I realized that a lot of his alcoholism was based on in because of feelings of shame, of not being adequate, of, uh, feeling like he wasn't providing enough for his family and stuff like that, you know, a uh, sense of failure. And I feel like I've carried a lot of that as well. And then I found out about this um, man who had written this book called uh, It Didn't Start With You. And mm -hmm. everything that he was saying sounded so true to me. Like, I really felt like a lot of what I'm dealing with in my lifetime isn't just me. It has to do also with with my ancestors uh, on both sides, not just on my dad's side, who's white, also on my mom's side, who's Haitian. So there's, there's some of that because some of the stuff I carry in my emotional body and some of these thoughts that I have repeatedly and they just feel like beyond me, you know? And I kind of made the connect, when I was looking at my chart, I kind of made the connection with my fourth house being, um, and the cusp being in Aquarius, and then also having my moon in a square to, to Uranus. So that's a piece of, of the puzzle I recently uncovered that I'm trying to now see how I could deal with all of that. 
mm. you know, because I know it's not all me, you know, and that's part I think of kind of separating yourself from your story and from your ego, you know, realizing that we're more than that. And maybe, you know, it depends on the paradigm that you abide by. But, you know, some of us believe that we came here for more than just us. We came here to like kind of clear li a lineage or like help with the healing yeah. of, of more than just our own individual self, you know? Yes. Yes. That's, that's what, I, what I would add. But um, for those of us who came here for that, these reasons of helping to ground new soul reality, and, um, I like to put things a little humorously. It's like, well, in order to be here, you have to be born. And that means you have to come into a family. And there's a notable lack of families on this planet at this time that are, that are functional. <laughs> so we're moving into conditioning patterns, no matter where we're born. And that, in fact, I believe that's true. Part of our work in healing from the conditioning that we've experienced is, a, is you know, there's the, an old Native American saying about seven generations back and seven generations forward. And I think this really relates even to DNA because this stuff is carried, the seeds of it are carried. And the healing that we do, I believe, is affecting both the past and the future oh, and, and is an important part of our work and why we're here. And we tend to be sensitive, empathic people and oftentimes don't realize the extent to which what we're feeling may not be our own. Not just in the family lineage, although it's very strong there, but just in general. Um, clients, people walking down the street, whatever, we can be affected because we have an awareness of the emotional fields and energies of those we encounter. And so becoming aware of this is, I, I am finding increasingly important because it can literally ask the question at times, is what I'm feeling actually me? And, um, you know, I, can, I mean, I feel it sometimes what you might call telepathically or just by the air, you know, about to do a talk is a very good example of it because the people that are going to be on the talk are thinking about the talk and, um, you know, you can feel that energy in the field. So in becoming aware of it, I find it's actually an opportunity for healing because I can be... If I can remain centered and calm and realize not everything I'm feeling may be mine, I'm actually transmitting some of that calm and healing back into the field of those who are around, who are coming into that space to transmit um, some of the acceptance and being okay that I'm talking about. And, in, in this very talk. So I feel that, um, I, I feel that in, in what you said, I'll, I'll toss out another name, which I've known for a while, but I've been paying little attention to lately, uh, about addiction, uh, is a man called Gabor Mate, which is G-A-B-O-R-M-A-T-E. And he has these, uh, you know, one of, his, one of his expressions I heard him say is, what was it? Not all traumatized people are addicts, but all addicts are traumatized people. And it's a very different approach to dealing and healing trauma, um, which is very heart-centered and comes without judgment, but an understanding. And it is basically that we have not learned how to take care of ourselves, putting other people's needs ahead of our own, diminishing our own because of our beliefs about ourselves and so forth. And that's the root of a whole lot, even of medical stuff that occurs. And 
Um, so it's just, if I, I'm not even, I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying if the name comes up, you heard it. You yeah. also heard it from me. Um, yeah, when I, what did I, I looked at your chart, you know, you have Pluto, I mean, right on your ascendant. And yeah. right on your ascendant. And first house Pluto is a soul. You know, the way we were taught a special mission, I don't really like saying it that way. But I just, they have something to do that's, that's potentially groundbreaking. It's just Aries first house ascendant. Um, and it's going, and it's, what is it? You have one, two, three, four, five, six retrograde planets. Yeah. Um, which to me is, a, the way I look at this is, that is a lot of stored up kinetic energy. There's, yeah. um, you have a lot of oomph to follow through on whatever it is that you feel. And in the, in the process of doing that, and you do it at your own pace and your own speed as you feel it, because you're gonna toss off, or not toss off, integrate, come to terms with the conflicts inside of you between what you feel is right and the parts of you that feel that of what you're supposed to do. Obligation, which is the, um, Capricorn stuff, South Node. And as you little by little gradually feel more confident that, oh, I'm doing the right things. You know, one of, one of the great sayings, one of Matt's great sayings lately is, just move at the speed of the slowest part of yourself. <laughs> In other words, we want to take along the whole self, not just the parts that have the ump and the fire, because we also have other parts that are afraid, scared, questioning, and we need the whole package. And we need the fast parts need to slow down and nurture and hold space for the slower parts. Because we, what we want to be doing here is integrating. In order for us to become aware consciously of our soul, we need to integrate all that we have. We're integrating our old personality, our old sense of me into the new sense of me that is coming up. And when you're in an ex that extended period of time of things don't feel right anymore. I don't want to do the stuff I, I used to do anymore. It doesn't feel right. I don't know exactly what I want to do. That's kind of the laid back or kicked back phase. That's, that is when a lot of integrating is going on, including integrating uncomfortable emotions that we have hanging around. And that's a very valid part of this moving forward. Our culture does not honor downtime or rest time very much. We want, you know, we're supposed to be productive all the time. And I find it just doesn't work that way. Um, in other words, through that space, you're developing your own self-healing. And as that, as that deepens, I can go a little bit longer here. As that deepens, um, you have that much more to offer to those around you because you're offering an integrated personality, which is most of us are kind of torn in pieces internally uh, with unresolved tensions and conflicts between the different parts of ourselves. I'm not saying we're, we're gonna have them all worked out because I think part of the reason we have these internal conflicts is just like if we have conflicts with somebody else, we get growth out of that. We get some growth out of the tension that occurs because we have to look at things that may be uncomfortable and we may not want to. So yeah. in, in spending time with self, 
when that feels right, we're getting the different parts of ourselves to know each other. They're not, some of them are never going to agree, but they can come to respect each other's needs. It's sort of like having a relationship, but with, with, uh, within oneself. Does this make sense? Yeah, it does. Especially the part about moving to the slowest part of yourself, I guess. It's all about patience in a certain way. Yeah. We could say with um, Pluto right on the ascendant, what else have you got going? You have Venus and Aries too. Um, you're going to have a natural impatience at times. It's just like, get on with it already. But there's, yeah. other, there's other parts of you that need time to slow down and integrate. And the speedy parts actually making the speedy parts actually making friends with the faster moving parts it's a really good symbiotic relationship because they each have something to offer each other okay the speedy parts put a little oomph in some of the slower parts and the slower parts remind the speedy parts hey it's good to you know <laughs> slow down and smell the flowers once in a while um mm -hmm. You're, here's another thing. The destiny of what you're going to do and how you're going to integrate it, my belief anyway, it's already in place. In other words, you don't need, you may feel anxious about it at times. You don't need to feel anxious about it because that's your life mission and life purpose and it's going to unfold. So it can relax with it and just let it unfold. A lot of the time, it's not going to be what you thought it was going to be or would like it to be, but it is what it is. And that's the part of it in my talk about, you know, learning to be okay with it. There's a bigger picture going on than we realize, and I don't have to like any or all of it. I don't have to like it, but I can respect it and allow it to operate. I find for myself, the more I see the bigger picture in action, the more respect I have for it. It naturally is developing. It's like, okay, you know what's going on. I think I do, but you know, sometimes I do. A lot of times I don't. So show me what's up. Show me why this is occurring. And the answer may not come instantly. So. Oh, thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. So let's see. Eight o'clock. Let's. Um, Nicole, you're there. Yeah, I'm here. There you are. All right. Um. So we're going to talk. Let's see, Nicole. I don't know why I feel like putting Nicole's, this is just an impulse, putting Nicole's chart up. So let me do that. Let's see if I got the right one. Um, Let's see. There's Nicole. Okay. So this is Nicole's chart. As we can see, oh, that's, I want, I don't want the transit chart. I want the regular chart. There. As, as we can see, Nicole has most of her chart below the horizon, so to speak. And this is, um, you know, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very inner or inward natural orientation. 
and yet you still have four, three planets in your first house, including Pluto. So it's a very interesting combination of how um, this is intended to play out. We also have the Libra rising, we've got the flipped um, signs and houses. So we have a Capricorn south node in the fourth house and a Cancer north node in the 10th house. Let me see. Nicole spent, not, not so much now, but she spent time in, a, in her 30s wanting to be a, a bit wild. And she, you had the children at the time. Mm -hmm. So she had three children and they, I assume they were young. Yeah. And, um, she was experimenting. She was trying, I look, you know, let's see what she's saying here. She's healing layer after layer of ego trauma nervous system. And, um, she has worked out various perspectives she had on sexuality and, and wants that you're, are you in that relationship you're writing about? Yes. Yeah. She's in a monogamous relationship that she feels is much more in service to her evolution. And being okay with herself as she is, is a constant challenge. Um, so she's, in a sense, uh, trying to, that's the way I put it, when I wrote her, with a Capricorn South Node, and, uh, you know, being in a family situation with kids and having a full first house, this would be a lot of restlessness and wanting to break free, wanting to break free to just blow up the, the conditioning. Mm -hmm. the, in other words, being young and having three kids, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I have no doubt that you loved your kids. That's not the issue. But it's like, when you have three kids at a relatively young age, you're and the young kids, you're your hands are kind of full mm -hmm. and there's other things going on inside. And so experimenting with that and, you know, what do I do? How do I do this? How do I break free? Um, certainly, sorry, I'm going to just do, I think I messed up the time. Let's see. Um, It would certainly be understandable about wanting to break out of that. And yet, uh, I don't know, as they say, the grass tends to look greener on the other side and, until you get to the other side. And then realizing, <laughs> I used to put it, I used to put it as, it's not that I don't think that people should change things at times. Certainly changes is in order at times, but many of us, especially when younger, try to change our inner lives by changing our external circumstances mm -hmm. and um, not realizing that the issue is inside, not outside. And so we trade in um, one set of issues for another set of issues and and, and discover that while the new set of issues may um, have the solution for some of the issues that I had in the old situation, <laughs> it also contains problems that didn't exist in the old situation. And um, so it's kind of like, but I think, you know, with the first house, 
like you have, you're very much an experiential learner. And you learn by doing, and it's not theoretical. And, um, you know, the way, I, to me, the way it works is as one gets a little older, you, it starts becoming like, I already jumped out of this plane and, uh, you know, it was painful, I remember. So it's not like I should stop jumping, but it's like taking more measured jumps, mm -hmm. thinking ahead a little bit or a lot. Um, but the impulse to act is always going to be there and it's supposed to be there. Not, that's not a bad thing. Of one thing with placement like that, I would say, is that there's a natural, uh, there may be a fear of the unknown or new situations at times, but it would tend to be combined with sort of an exhilaration of sort of the thrill of the unknown at the same time as the, uh, you know, fear of the unknown of what's going to happen and so forth. And it's, it can be, I'm not saying it's you, but it can be even, there can even be a little bit of a thrill in feeling a certain amount of the fear because mm -hmm. it's related to, you know, being wild or unknown and, and that sort of thing. So the issue becomes learning how to use that, um, in a in a wise wise way, which comes from experience, and the experience comes from, let's say, having done things when younger, in what would you one would not now call a wise way. Actually, was wise because the wisdom came out of that. Uh, maybe I don't want to do that anymore. Not like that. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was learned. And that's a totally valid way to learn. Mm -hmm. Kind of wired that way. Um, it's interesting that well, you have the, the moon above the horizon in the 12th house, but it's literally just above the horizon. It's very interesting that the objects above, far above the horizon are the North Node and, and Chiron. Um, and the Chiron being in Taurus in the eighth house. And it would say to me that um, some of the experiences, especially in the past, and eighth house can very much relate to intimate relationships would have been quite painful. Mm -hmm. um, your opening or feeling or emotional states would be to really throw yourself into what you're doing. And the, you know, not everybody can handle that, which I suspect, I suspect you. <laughs> um, and, and none of that is wrong at all. Mm -hmm. But I, the way I look at it is because the current is in Taurus, it's like one of the lessons that would be gotten there is, and the bottom line, I know that what's safe is I need to learn, I need to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And yet, out of all those wounds, the sense of, can I actually take care of myself, could be questioned. Mm -hmm. Because why do I keep doing things that are bringing this stuff out that's causing this pain? That could be, in that realm, um, you know, she said she felt like a hot mess. And um, I like to rephrase that. 
How about if we say, I had a lot of intense experiences that I had not yet been able to integrate. Mm. Yeah. Because I think that's a lot kinder. Not, and I'm, you know, I'm not just using words as euphemisms. In other words, I think hot mess is, I think you deserve more than that. Mm. Um, it's okay that you were unhappy in hindsight with some of your choices, but I'll bet you you entered them pretty innocently within your heart. And so they didn't work out in the way you thought they might. Um, and you didn't like some of the results of what happened. And that's okay too. But again, it doesn't to me mean that you did anything wrong. And then, so we can look at it as, I don't know why. Well, actually I do know why. You wanted to break free. That's, that's the bottom line. The Capricorn South node is a tendency to feel really held back inside and all kinds of shoulds and whatnot that I have to live up to. Mm -hmm. And that when I don't, when I try to break free and I don't, I feel guilty about it, even though I, I can't stand feeling the way I do, and I can't stand how I feel when I try to break out of it. Yeah. So these two parts kind of need to honor each other. You actually came to that, I think, when you spoke about, um, uh, I, I didn't read the part, I'll, I'll read this part that she said. She's currently a homemaker and raising three amazing children, and in truth, raising myself and healing layer after layer of ego, trauma, nervous system. And what I wrote to her is, and this is my, strong feeling that raising three children and allowing them to be who they are and um, not raising them with a whole bunch of shoulds and, uh, you know, don'ts, and, and I don't mean running wild, but is allowing them to have their own experience and their own identity is about the most amazing thing that anybody can do for the planet at this time. You know, I have oh, one of my little humorous pieces was, has been the last couple of years. Well, I finally figured out the first time somebody told me I was doing it wrong. Well, when was that? About two minutes after I was born. <laughs> And this is, I would say, the majority of people's experience mm -hmm. as children. And again, I'm not saying, you know, you already found that one can overdo um, being a little too wild, shall we say. So you have this wisdom. So you have a, you have a balance or a balance that you're, learning or working together to share with your kids mm -hmm. to give them freedom but not wild permissiveness but not repression either mm -hmm. and to learn to work work in that flow and I think this is incredibly important because I've met a few people not a lot that came out of, on the relative scale, loving, functional family backgrounds. I don't feel like there's a whole lot of them, but some. And their experience as grown people, young adults, whatever, is very different than the majority of people's experience from what I've seen. And I consider that really huge and really important. And with a chart like you have, where so much is below the horizon, it's kind of like a life that you're 
um, living out almost a little bit silently, mm -hmm. very personally. And it's not like you have, um, I don't know, you know, great desires to take on the whole world and, or, or you know, educate the whole world and all this. Yes, inside, but in a quiet way, I mean. In other words, not center stage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really, really important. That is like having the home. And it's like having a lot of um, emotional wealth mm. that you really have to, not you, but uh, if other people are going to see it, it might not be obvious at first because it's not going to be real flashy and thrown around. But if they take the time to move into that space, they're going to find a lot of depth. In, in you. And that north node pointing up there in Cancer is, to me, when you feel it, to go out, expose, express yourself, it's going to be in that realm, cancer realm, of emotion, family, um, sharing your experiences, first house, that have made you who you are, what worked and what didn't work, with other people that may be struggling with some of the same issues of how do I break free? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That Chiron is like in Taurus in the eighth house. That I mean, I see that there's the healing through the monogamous relationship. You know, I, I am assuming you have a partner that lets you be yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what I see as a Taurus, and that's the healing. It's like I can be myself in relationship. I don't have to become compulsive, codependent all this, it's okay. And yeah, my partner has Chiron uh, Taurus also. I just found out. <laughs> so it's cool. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. It's mm -hmm. so like each of you allowing each other the space, you don't have to lose or submerge yourself mm -hmm. in order to be in this partnership. And again, I feel like that is um, very crucial in moving forward on the whole planet because we don't, at this point, have a whole lot of that. We don't have that. There aren't that many models of that. And that's where we need to go or where we are going in order to create functional families and functional young people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's see, it is 23, 23. So um, does, does anyone have any comments? Let me, open, let me take off this chart. Does anyone have comments, questions, uh, suggestions, contributions they would like to make? We have few minutes left. Give us give us a moment, Steve. Sure. Hi, Steve. Um, I just wanted to comment. I really appreciate what you said um, about moving as slow as the slowest part, you know, the slowest part of your chart, slowest part of your being. Um, especially those of us with um, a lot of, you know, the Aries archetype um, in our charts. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and looking at that, you know, that south node of Pluto, Saturn, and Jupiter for everybody in Capricorn, you know, that pressure to always be doing something. So, yeah, yeah. I really appreciated that. 
Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. And I, you know, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about this um, Pluto South Node Saturn conjunction that's happening, which I feel is affecting and will continue to affect the entire planet. And for some people, of course, it's personal, but it's affecting everything. And because we clearly, collectively need to move into another whole sort of reality. And let's, let's put it this way. With that transit, to me, we are moving into a whole other sort of reality. And I don't feel anybody can say exactly what that is or what it's going to look like. And it's freaking out a lot of people that are afraid, uh, which I feel is an inevitable part of the change. My perspective is, um, you know, the new earth or new reality, so to speak, in the future is a done deal. It's already done. And I, I look at these things more and more like it's a movie script. And we don't know the script when we're watching the movie. We don't want to know it. But it's our, we already know where the movie, I mean, somebody already knows where the movie is going. And we're in the process of doing this. And we are all torn up in knots inside, not, I can't say all, but most of us are torn up in knots inside about the different parts of ourselves that are not in harmony with each other and that we shadow, don't even want to own. My personal, um, you know, I was known, I was labeled as a child as an, an angry kid. I was angry, angry. I was introduced by my parents at times, oh, he's so angry. No, I don't, you know, I'm beginning to learn what I was angry about. It was never any consideration given to what I was angry about or if there was any validity to it. It was just labeled as that. So I discover I had a lot of shame uh, that developed out of that from being labeled. And so I don't want to show my anger to people because I learned early on they don't like it when you're angry. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, kind of like you're just supposed to smile and take it. Well, my individuality was not honored or respected. I had good parents. I didn't have overt, you know, I didn't have what would be considered abuse, but I had emotional, I had emotional neglect is what I'm learning. And that wasn't considered abuse. Uh, even now, we're just learning that it's kind of abuse. Why did I have that? My parents were good people. That's the way they were raised. They didn't know. They had no clue. We're of a time of generations that we're learning about our emotions. We're learning about the cause of our traumas. We're learning about the cause of why we're knotted up inside and what a more balanced um, personality looks like. I mean, I was surprised, you know, personalities are complex. We have a lot of parts, we have a lot of pieces and they're fragmented. I stuff my anger because I got rejected for being angry. So I don't wanna be angry. So then it comes out in passive aggressive ways at times, snarky remarks, you know, rolling of eyes and other things. So, um, I'm in the process and, and it's stepping up. I was talking earlier about the graduation present of seeing more of this stuff more deeply. Uh, uh, that's happening for me. And 
I am needing and wanting to embrace my anger, to understand my anger. It comes up, I mean, I get, when it comes up now, I get angry about stuff. <laughs> it feels like I'm two years old because it literally is, because it's been sitting there all this time. So this is what I'm talking about, uh, you know, Wanda, not just about anger, but about taking the time to embrace all these parts of ourselves. And they need attention because they didn't get attention when we were kids. And it's not always because the parents were bad or ignorant. They just didn't know and they didn't have time. They were too busy trying to keep their family going. But we now want to integrate because we want to bring the whole package along. I don't need to be ashamed that I have shame. I don't need to be ashamed that I have anger. I don't need to be ashamed that I don't like having anger or I don't like feeling anger. I don't like feeling shame. This is why I gave the talk the title of um, learn to be okay with what is. What is, if I'm feeling shame, what is, is I'm feeling shame and I don't like it and it's okay. I don't have to like it. This is the beautiful part. I don't have to let it to be spiritual. I don't have to like it. I, I, it helps if I accept it. If I acknowledge, okay, I have shame. I feel shame. I don't like the way you feel shame. But I get there's reasons why you're there. And I want to take the time with you to find out what do you need? What is the shame? What does my shame need emotionally? What does it need? Nobody's ever asked it that. For all the different parts of us, what do these parts need? If you got rejected by your parents for sitting around and reading books <laughs> or writing poetry or whatever, because you were supposed to be doing this and that and the other thing and da 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 da, you're going to feel weird about taking time off until you heal, until you integrate. You're going to feel weird about taking time off, about giving yourself the time and the space. If you have a bunch of Capricorn stuff, it doesn't have to only be that, but it can even, or, or Virgo, sixth house, tenth house. You can feel indulgent. Don't you know there's starving children that need help? I was raised, <laughs> I was raised pretty much every night, or many nights, that I had to eat all the vegetables on my plate because there's children in India who are starving. I had to get into my 40s to realize that even if I hadn't eaten them, <laughs> they weren't going to India. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, it had nothing to do. I mean, it's crazy, but as little kids, we just accept this stuff as norm. So I, can, I didn't get angry when I realized that one, but I have stuff from childhood I got angry about. I, realized, I have reason to be angry about it. And I can sit with that anger until I'm ready to let it go. Just popped into my head. This is like the five stages of grief, or I think it's five, however many. If I'm gonna let go of something even that I don't like, there's grief associated with it because it's been part of me for a long, long time. I don't know who I am without that. How do I know who I'm gonna be if I let go of my inherent sadness? I don't. I don't know how to be a person that doesn't have inherent sadness. It doesn't mean I'm gonna be happy, happy, happy all the time, but it can mean I can experience that there's difficult things in life without having to, that to bring me down or make me feel like something is wrong. It's just what is, I don't know why. That's the acceptance part. I don't know why, as I come to trust the process of life that it has my best wishes and everybody else's in mind, despite 
all the despicable, horrible, painful things that we know are going on. It's still true that in the deepest sense, life is watching out for us, even though we have to go through, or some of us have to go through some unspeakable things. And I can hold space for those that are having to go through all of that. And in my heart, reminding them, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So all of this is to have space and time for all these, the needs, for all these parts to get together. Um, if I have the part that is, to, let's say, um, let's say that I've never given a talk on EA Zoom astrology, and I have this feeling I want to give a talk, and I've never given a talk, and I'm really afraid. But I have, you know, an Aries part that says, you got to do this now. And I got other parts of me that are freaking out. Acting too soon can actually re-traumatize. It's important to keep this in mind. Acting too soon can actually re-traumatize. And that's not a good thing. So if the parts that want to act can act like the big brother and the big sister to the parts that are afraid, instead of being mad at them or shoving them in their room, it's like, okay, what is it you're afraid of? What do you need? I don't need to heal that or fix it. Some of those parts just want to be heard. They just want to be heard. Nobody's listened to them. They just want to know. You can break out in tears out of the blue from having a part like that, feeling that somebody, and it's part of me, actually cares enough to want to really hear and feel what that part has held for a very long time. I am going to stop with that, and I am sure <laughs> that I will be picking up somewhere along the line of what we left off with um, in future talks. So I appreciate all of you. We had, um, I enjoyed meeting all you volunteers, like very awesome people, and all that you are dealing with and owning and working with in your lives, which to me is a contribution along with me to uplifting the whole planet, which is our, I know is our heartfelt intent as best we know how in the small ways that we know how. But there's a whole lot, I assure you, there's a whole lot of us that are doing that and there's more people getting on the bandwagon. So the news is likely to get worse and worse. Um, you know, what, in other words, what you see on the news is likely to get worse and worse. I was a, I was a, I have been a lifelong news junkie, lifelong news junkie. And um, I no longer need, I don't, I don't, follow the news anymore. I'm not oblivious to it. I just occasionally look at the headlines. I know the direction things are going. And I feel like the quality of my life has greatly improved. Um, you know, I'm learning even to like these guys who uh, 21, 22 years old, killing a bunch of people. Uh, I used to find them despicable and, you know, want them to go to hell and all this. But I realize more and more the amount of pain that's in their souls. And I, as best I can, send blessings to them, as well as to those whose families who lost people, who experienced this scene, just being there, utterly traumatizing, even if you personally are not a affected by anyone who was wounded. But 
we, you know, not to be, um, I've not been accused very often of, <laughs> of having my head in the stars and, and you know, being Pollyanna-like. But understanding that all these people are souls, they're fellow brother and sister souls, and they need love. And I send blessings that their souls may heal uh, from what they have experienced and that we collectively add to that pool so that we're bringing healing rather than judgment and um, rejection, which I would say has a lot to do with why people get to those kind of crazy places in the first place. So I'm going to end with that. Uh, this, this has been, I, I really love this talk and I appreciate all of you being here. It's been uh, very wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. And thank you also to your volunteers, Monica, Amanda, May, Lisa, and Nicole. Would you all please now unmute and thank Steve Wilson. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. You're, you're all very welcome. Thank you for being very vulnerable and with your personal stuff. Until we meet again. There we go. Yay. Bye. Thanks, Steve. Wonderful. Bye.